My, my feeling, Charlie, is that um, it's, it's not that um, pseudoscience and superstition and uh, New Age so-called beliefs and uh, fundamentalist zealotry are something new. They've been with us for as long as we've been, we've yeah. been human. But we live in an age based on science and technology with formidable technological powers. Science and technology are propelling us forward at accelerating rates. That's right. And if we don't understand it, and by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? Just uh, some members of Congress? But there's no more than a handful of members of Congress with any background in science at all. And the Republican Congress has just abolished its own Office of Technology Assessment, mm -hmm. the organization that gave them bipartisan, competent <laughs> advice on science and technology. They say, we don't want to know. Don't tell yeah. us about science Surprising. and technology. Surprising. It's the danger of all this. I mean, you know, this is not the thing that... There, there's two kinds of dangers. One is what I just yeah. talked about, that we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power, sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? And the second reason that I'm, I'm worried about this is that science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson laid great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us. Our own planet is only a tiny part of the vast cosmic tapestry, a starry fabric of worlds yet untold. Those worlds in space are as countless as all the grains of sand and all the beaches of the Earth. Each of those worlds is as real as ours. In every one of them, there's a succession of incidents, events, occurrences, which influence its future. Countless worlds, numberless moments, an immensity of space and time. And our small planet, at this moment, here we face a critical branch point in history. What we do with our world right now will propagate down through the centuries and powerfully affect the destiny of our descendants. It is well within our power to destroy our civilization and perhaps our species as well. If we capitulate to superstition or greed or stupidity, we can plunge our world into a darkness deeper than the time between the collapse of classical civilization and the Italian Renaissance. But we are also capable of using our compassion and our intelligence, our technology and our wealth to make an abundant and meaningful life for every inhabitant of this planet, to enhance enormously our understanding of the universe and to carry us to the stars. There are an enormous number of stars. Only some of them will have planets suitable for life. On only some of those worlds will intelligence arise. And perhaps a few of those civilizations will avoid the trap jointly set by their technology and their passions. If there are many civilizations, one of them should be rather close by. 
If there are few civilizations, then even the nearest may be very far away. This is one of the great questions. How many advanced civilizations capable, at least of radio astronomy, are there in the Milky Way galaxy? Let's call the number of such civilizations by the capital letter N. It's a number. It depends on many things. It depends on the total number of stars in the Milky Way. Let's call that um, N sub star. It depends on the fraction of stars that have planets. Let's call that F sub P. It depends on the average number of planets in a given solar system that are ecologically suitable for life. Let's call that N sub E. It depends on the fraction of suitable planets in which life actually arises. Call that F sub L. It depends on the fraction of inhabited planets on which intelligence emerges. Let's call that F sub I. And on the fraction of those planets in which the intelligent beings evolve a technical, communicative civilization, call that F sub C. Finally, it depends on the fraction of a planet's lifetime that's graced by a technical civilization, call that F sub L. If we multiply all these numbers together, we've estimated capital N, the number of civilizations. This equation, due mainly to Frank Drake of Cornell, is only a sentence. The verb is equals. So let's try to go through the program of this equation. By carefully counting the number of stars in small but representative regions of the sky, we find that the total number of stars in the Milky Way is about 400 billion. It's a lot of stars. What about planets? Well, in studies of double stars, in investigations of the motions of nearby stars, and in many theoretical studies, we get a strong hint that many, perhaps even most stars, are accompanied by planets. So let's take F sub P, the fraction of stars that have planets, as a quarter. Then the total number of planetary systems in the galaxy is 400 billion times a quarter, or 100 billion. We'll write down our running totals in red. Now, if each system were to have, say, 10 planets, as ours does, there would be 100 billion times 10, or a trillion worlds in the galaxy, a vast arena for the cosmic drama. In our own solar system, there are several bodies that might be suitable for life, life of some sort. There's the Earth, of course, but there are possibilities for Mars, for Titan, perhaps for Jupiter. If other systems are similar, there may be many suitable worlds per system, but to be conservative, let's choose N sub E equal two. Two worlds suitable for life per system. Then the number of planets in the galaxy that are suitable for life would be 100 billion times two or 200 billion. Now, what about life? Under very general cosmic conditions, the molecules of life are readily made. They spontaneously self-assemble. It's conceivable that there might be some impediment, like some difficulty in the origin of the genetic code, say, although I think that's very unlikely given billions of years for evolution. On the Earth, life arose very fast after the planet was formed. So let's choose F sub L, the fraction of suitable worlds in which life does arise, as a half. In that case, the total number of planets in the Milky Way in which life has arisen once is 100 billion times 2 times a half, or again, 100 billion. 100 billion inhabited worlds. Now, the estimates get tougher. Many individually unlikely events had to occur for our species and our technology to emerge. On the other hand, there might be many different roads to high technology. Some scientists think that the path from trilobites to radio telescopes, or the equivalent, goes like a shot in all planetary systems. Other scientists disagree. Let's take some middle ground and choose F sub i as a tenth and F sub C is also a tenth. 
meaning that only 1%, the 10th times the 10th, of inhabited planets eventually produce a technical civilization. If we were to multiply all these factors together, we would find 100 billion times a 10th times a 10th, or 1 billion planets on which civilizations have arisen at least once. Now, what percentage of the lifetime of a planet is marked by a technical civilization? The Earth has harbored a civilization capable of radio astronomy only for a few decades, the last few decades, out of a lifetime of a few billion years. It's hardly out of the question that we might destroy ourselves tomorrow. If that's a typical case, then F sub big L would be a few decades divided by a few billion years, or one hundred millionth, a very small number. And then big N would be a billion times a hundred millionth, or N maybe just 10, 10 civilizations, a tiny smattering, a pitiful few technological civilizations in the galaxy. But civilizations then might take billions of years of tortuous evolution to arise and then snuff themselves out in an instant of unforgivable neglect. If this is a typical case, there may be few others, maybe nobody else at all, for us to talk to. But consider the alternative, that occasionally civilizations learn to live with high technology and survive for geological or stellar evolutionary timescales. If only 1% of civilizations can survive technological adolescence, then F sub big L would be not a hundred millionth, but only a hundredth. And then the number of civilizations would be a billion times a hundred. The number of civilizations in the galaxy then would be measured in the millions, millions of technical civilizations. So if civilizations do not always destroy themselves shortly after discovering radio astronomy, then the sky may be softly humming with messages from the stars, with signals from civilizations enormously older and wiser than we. If there are millions of technical civilizations in the Milky Way, each capable of radio astronomy, how far away is the nearest one? Come back, sir. Thank you, sir. Great to see you. Uh, listen to this. I hate to read too much, but this is it's almost like they've been reading your book. This is from the New York Times for Friday, uh, May 24. Americans flunk science, a study finds. Less than half of all American adults understand that the Earth orbits the sun yearly, according to a basic science survey. Nevertheless, there's enthusiasm for research, except in some fields like genetic engineering and nuclear power that are viewed with suspicion. Only about 25% of American adults get passing grades in a National Science Foundation survey of what people know about basic science and economics. I mean, this is singing your song, isn't it? Well, it's certainly what I'm talking about in, in the demon haunted right. world. My, my feeling, Charlie, is that um, it's, it's not that um, pseudoscience and superstition and uh, new age so-called beliefs and uh, fundamentalist zealotry are something new. They've been with us for as long as we've, been, we've yeah. been human. But we live in an age based on science and technology with formidable technological powers. Science and technology are propelling us forward at accelerating rates. That's right. And if we don't understand it, and by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? Just uh, some members of Congress? But there's no more than a handful of members of Congress with any background in science at all. And the Republican Congress has just abolished its own Office of Technology Assessment, mm -hmm. the organization that gave them bipartisan, competent <laughs> advice on yep. science and technology. They say, we don't want to know. Don't tell yeah. us about science Surprising, and technology. Surprising, because Gingrich is genuinely interested, I think, in he these is. kinds no of things question. as a, you no know, a, out of a, his own intellectual curiosity. Does the president still have a science advisor? 
uh, in the he White does. House? He does. John Gibbon, and and the vice president uh, is scientifically well literate. Being yes, scientifically a science maven. I mean, you you blast them all: creationist, uh, Christian scientists who sh you say would rather allow their children uh, to suffer uh, than give them insulin or antibiotics. Uh, astrologers come in for particular scorn on your part. <laughs> well, I would say scorn, just uh, derision. Derision. <laughs> <laughs> a more generous version of scorn. You know? and, but what's the danger of all this? I mean, you know, this is not the thing that... There, there's two kinds of dangers. One is what I just yeah. talked about, that we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power sooner or later is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? And the second reason that um, I'm worried about this is that science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us mm -hmm. that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson lay great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated, and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us. Jefferson was amazing in his devotion to science. We Absolutely. think of Jefferson as this man who was literate and who was a passionate uh, articulator of freedom. But if you go to Monticello, exactly. what you appreciate is he was at heart a scientist, a botanist, an architect, geologist, a geologist, it, and if you Meriwether Lewis, as we know, know from Stephen Ambrose, mm -hmm. you know, he wanted him to go out and do experimentations and explore and be skeptical and find answers to passages and explore uh, the uh, way. Exactly right. And there was also an economic uh, yeah. grail right, there right, if the right, Northwest right, Passage right, was found. Right. Uh, Jefferson said that uh, he was at heart a scientist that he would have loved to have been a scientist. But there were certain events happening in America <laughs> that called to him, and so he devoted his life yeah. to that kind of a politics. Revolution. Indeed. Yeah. So that generations later, people could be scientists. Yeah. Have we, the point is made, and maybe by you, you know, is it, when's the last time we had a president who made a speech about science, you know? Yeah, I right. mean, and made I us, say that. You know, uh, it is this notion that, that Science is of not of great interest to us in some sense, that, that somehow we don't want to learn. You see, people read the stock market quotations and financial pages. Look how complex that is. And because yet we they know the direct connection to their own. There's a motivation, but they're capable of large numbers of people. People are able to look at sports statistics. Look how many people can do that. Understanding science is not more difficult than that. It doesn't involve greater intellectual activities. But the, the thing about science is, first of all, it's after the way the universe really is and not what makes us feel good. And a lot of the competing doctrines are after what feels good and not what, what's okay. true. Okay, but you've got to make, and I'm not sure you'll go this far with me, but I mean, there's a lot of that that is about feeling good and there's a lot of that that's about hocus pocus. But at the same time, there are millions of people who understand science does not prove religion, but because religion is faith-based. And faith. therefore, you should de not deny the value of it because it is faith-based and not science. But let's, but let's, let's, look, let's look a little more deeply into that. What is faith? It is belief in the absence of evidence. Now, I don't propose to tell anybody what to believe, but for me, believing when there's no compelling evidence is a mistake. The idea is to withhold belief until there is compelling evidence. And if the universe does not comply with our predispositions, 
okay, then we have the wrenching obligation to uh, accommodate to the way the universe but I think really you is. Could, you, I mean, but I mean, you, so you step forward to say, I deny all religion because I can't see no, it proved no, no, no. scientifically? No, no, no. You and see, the it, value it, of religious it, experience it, it, and the value of, 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 of reaching for higher experiences. Let me say, religion deals with history, with poetry, with great literature, with ethics, with morals, including the morality of uh, treating compassionately the least fortunate among us. All of these are things that I endorse wholeheartedly. Where religion gets into trouble is in those cases that it pretends to know something about science. The science in the Bible, for example, was acquired by the Jews from the Babylonians during the Babylonian captivity of 600 BC. That was the best science on the planet then. But we've learned something since then. Roman Catholicism, uh, Reformed Judaism, most of the mainstream Protestant denominations have no difficulty with uh, the idea that humans have evolved from other creatures, that uh, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, with the Big Bang. They don't have any trouble with that. The trouble comes with people who are biblical literalists, right. who believe that the Bible is dictated by the creator of the universe to an unerring stenographer. And so therefore they... And, and has no metaphor or allegory. And in from it. there they make their political and economic choices. Uh, and social and, choices. And scientific. And scientific choices. And, and scientific. And that's part of your problem with that idea. Exactly. It is that because for the wrong reasons, we make the wrong choices about science. That's right. So who is more humble? The scientist who looks at the universe with an open mind and accepts whatever the universe has to teach us, or somebody who says everything in this book must be considered the literal truth and never mind the fallibility of all the human beings involved in the writing of this book. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I accept that, but I also, the argument would be made by many is that, you know, you don't have to, whether, whether an a specific scientific act took place as described by some, some biblical writer is not, is, is not at the heart of the religious faith and the religious experience. Some people agree with you and some people don't. Some people think that every jot and tittle in the Bible is essential. You throw one thing away to allegory or metaphor, then it's up to everybody to make their own decision. Then how are we, this, a lot of this has to do with science in the United States. Are we different than other no, nations? No, absolutely not. You can see this worldwide. Uh, in India, there's a, a madness about astrology. In Britain, it's ghosts. In Germany, it's rays coming up from the earth that can only be detected by dowsers. Uh, every country uh, has its, its own specialties. We, we seem to be fascinated by UFOs right now. But one so thing... What, what is that? Before you leave yeah. UFOs, <laughs> so, tell me about you and Professor Mack. John Mack is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard who uh -huh. I've known for many years. Um, we... Uh, were arrested together at the Nevada nuclear test site protesting U.S. testing in the face of a Soviet moratorium on testing. Um, and many years ago, he asked me, what, what is there in this UFO business? Is there anything to it? And I said, absolutely nothing, except, of course, for a psychiatrist. <laughs> he is a psychiatrist. Well, he looked into it and uh, decided that... Uh, there was so much emotional energy in the reports of people who claimed to be abducted that uh, it couldn't possibly be some psychological aberration, that it had to be true. He believed his patients. I do not believe his patients. Many of these stories are uh, about waking up from a deep sleep and finding your bed surrounded by three or four short, doer, gray, and sexually obsessed beings yeah. who then take you to their spaceship after they slither you through, their wa through your wall and perform uh, a variety okay, of well, objectionable we, sexual uh, yeah. experiments. But on here it. we have <coughs> Dr. Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. uh, astronomer, versus Dr. John, I mean, Dr. what's his first John name? Mack. John yeah. Mack. Uh, M.D. 
No question. So what's the problem? How could He's a how, could, how can scientists disagree? He's a scientist. Is that what you're well, asking? Well, no, I'm asking how could, I mean, what do you think of this man coming to these I conclusions? I think he is not using the scientific method in approaching his issue. And when he, you constantly, I mean, I assume you come at him with both barrels in conversation. And, and in the demon haunted yeah. world. And he says? He says, I don't appreciate the emotional force. You don't. Of, of, uh, of these, these reports. Many people awaken from a nightmare with profound emotional force. That doesn't mean that the nightmare is yeah. true. It means something went on inside our head. You were making a point before I jumped to John Mack. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, what I wanted to say is, uh, uh, going back to the question of, uh, of adequate evidence on something that's emotionally really, uh, mm -hmm. really pulling you, um, <clears throat> I... Uh, I lost both my parents about uh, 12 or 15 years ago, and uh, I had a great relationship with them. I really miss them. I would love to believe that their spirits were around somewhere, and I'd give almost anything to uh, spend five minutes a year with them. Do you hear their voices ever? Uh, sometimes. About uh, six or eight times since their death I've heard it. Carl, just, just in the voice of my father or my mother. Now, I don't think that means that they're in the next room. I think it means that they're in your <clears throat> I've had an auditory hallucination. I, I was with them so long. I heard their voices so often. Why shouldn't I be able to make a vivid recollection of it? Here's what's interesting about this for me. I mean, I mean, you won't see this, but I'll throw it at you anyway. You convinced me a long time ago that it was arrogant for me or for anyone else to believe that there wasn't some life outside of our... To exclude the possibility. To exclude the possibility was, right. was, was, to, was an arrogance of intellect that we should not I still assume. Believe that. You couldn't prove it. You didn't know it was there. But the arrogance for you... Right. We don't know if it's there. We don't know if it's not there. Let's look. And if you take that... Mm -hmm. Why can't you say, there's a lot we don't know. I, there's I a say lot it. of power Here, there that we there's don't know. There's a lot we don't know. You know? I, I, it's what I believe. About but that doesn't mean that every, every fraudulent claim has to be accepted. We, we demand the most rigorous standards of evidence, especially on what's important to us. So if some guy comes up to me, in a, a channeler or a medium, and says, I can put you in touch with your parents. <laughs> well, because I want so terribly to, to believe that, yeah. I know I have to reach in for added reserves of skepticism because I'm likely to be fooled and, and uh, much more minor to have my money taken. Yeah, what was it, Jay-Z Knight, was it? Yeah, yeah exactly. She, she has a guy named Ramtha, who's 10,000 years old or 35. something. 35. 35, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, he tells you lots of things, but nothing about what life was like 35,000 years Shirley, ago. Shirley MacLaine believes. Uh, Shirley McLean believes that Ramtha was her brother. <laughs> uh, uh, things like the Loch Ness monster, and mm -hmm. big, all that. Again, is, is it photograph? Oh, fakes! <laughs> I, I mean, the most famous uh, photograph uh, has now been shown to be a fake. But could there be a uh, unknown mammal or even reptile uh, of large dimensions swimming in an Irish in a Scottish lake? Sure there could. That we don't know about? Sure yeah. there could. Who says no? But nobody. But the evidence does not support it, does not demonstrate it. So do we say, oh, ridiculous? Yeah. No, we don't do that. We say unproved, which is a Scottish verdict. Some reviewers differ with your conclusions on this point, that you seem to say it's growing this kind of pseudoscience. No, and I, I, I don't, or, or sorry to interrupt. I, I, I don't. We, we've, this is part of being human. Humans have had this way of magical thinking through all of our history. The problem is that today the technology has reached formidable, maybe even awesome proportions. And so the dangers of thinking this way mm. are larger. Not that this is a new kind of thing. You are living with myelodysplasia. Or I have been. You have been. It's in remission. Or you have... <clears throat> what? Well, you know, with, with diseases of this sort and all cancers... Cancer it, uh, the bone marrow? 
It, it's mild dysplasia is not exactly cancer of the bone marrow, but if untreated, it inevitably leads to leukemia. Um, and the trouble with all these diseases is you never know that you've got every last cell. Um, you can only detect down to a certain level. But down to the level that anybody can detect, and in terms of how I feel and my stamina and all that, it seems to be gone. And I'm very lucky. Because that. you had a sister who uh, my sister, now my sister enabled Carrie. you to have a bone marrow transplant. That's one. And also the enormous advances in scientific, uh, in medical science, in just the last few years. If I had had this thing five or ten years ago, I would be dead sure as shooting. And then finally, the love and support of my family. All, all of those have played a central role. So you're optimistic? As I'm you very know. optimistic, I'm, uh, or at least very hopeful. And just share with us, because of your, your sense of, of language and, and, and your sense of understanding and, and being reflective and introspective, what, does, what do you think about and what does it do for you to I didn't to have, have any near death to say to you. I didn't no, have any near-death experiences. I, I didn't have a religious conversion. But, but you I thought about what it would be like to die. Certainly, and what it would be like for my, my family. Oh, right. And, and uh, I didn't much think about what it would be like for me because I don't think it's likely there's anything that you think about after you're dead. That's um, it, huh? <laughs> yeah, long, dreamless sleep. I'd love to believe the opposite, but I don't know of any evidence. But one thing... Faith, Carl. Faith. <laughs> one thing that it has done is to enhance my uh, sense of appreciation for the, the beauty of life, life. Uh, and of the universe and the, the sheer joy of being alive. You had a healthy portion of that before this, but even you, it happens to. Oh, there's no question. No of question. Beauty every moment, and every every inanimate object, and to say nothing of, of the exquisite complexity of, uh, of living beings. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you imagine missing it all, and suddenly it's so much more precious. May you live a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joe. Pleasure. Same here. Carl Sagan, Science as a Candle in the Dark. The title of the book is A Demon Haunted World. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. of the night. Hello. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Jacob. And how old are you, Jacob? Nine. You're nine! <laughs> Jacob, I was nine when I first discovered the universe, or actually, the universe discovered me. I was at a planetarium, and they, the lights went out, and the stars came out, and I was nine, and my head exploded. <laughs> Not, it didn't literally explain. Like, brains weren't over the seat. Yeah, yeah. So, do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Why don't the humans just shoot a chunk of random material at the asteroid Apophis and to either destroy it or get it out of the collision course with the Earth? I mean, why don't we just bump it out of the way, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, basically. okay. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here in America, he's a kid. He doesn't need to sit down. He's a kid. I'm a grown-up. I need to sit down. Here in America, we have a lot of bombs and stuff like that, and we're really good at blowing stuff up. And we're not as good at knowing where the pieces go afterwards. So suppose you go and blow it up. And here's this huge asteroid. Now it breaks into two chunks. So now that map is not just a chunk burying the west coast of the United States. Now another chunk goes and hits the Atlantic Ocean and buries the east coast of the United States. Now you have to evacuate two coasts. So, yes, you want to completely destroy it. That's just harder to know how to do it effectively. So you, you nudge it. You, yeah, you, that you, comes to the second part of my question, which is oh, okay. why don't they just shoot like a chunk of rocket? Just go, okay, this is the this is the clipboard is the asteroid, and this is the chunk of rock. And then you have a clipboard? Here. No. <laughs> folder. 
Well, uh -huh. it's, just, it's cool. You carry around a clipboard. I'm just saying. Okay, this is the chunk. It just goes and it floats off into space and it hits like the sun. Okay. Okay. So here's another problem. Here's another problem. We don't really know for sure how how strong the asteroid is in its material. So, so for uh, what's an example? Um, let's say there's a big pile of dough on the table. Let's just not not money dough. I'm talking about like cookie like, dough. Yeah, yeah, like like cookie dough. Cookie dough, or uh, be, better yet, pancake. No, no, bread dough, okay? So now I want to move the dough out of the way. And I take my two fingers and I push it. What happens to my fingers? They go inside the dough. They don't push the whole dough because the dough is not... Is, the dough it's not like, is, 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 is it's not... not a so, it's a non-Newtonian solid. I it is a non-Newtonian solid. <laughs> exactly. You try to push it, it doesn't, it absorbs your push. So, and we think some asteroids are not solid. Y'all can just go home now, I'm having a conversation <laughs> with the kid. It's not, some asteroids we think are not actually solid, that they're piles of rubble. Well, no, we think they're piles of rubble. But how would it stay together? From its own gravity. That's the thing. So its gravity kind of holds it together as a pile of rubble. But you push over here, this rubble goes away, and this rubble stays. So we don't want to risk the future of our species thinking that the asteroid is a solid object that we can just push. Uh, now, you want to get rid of it. And I said, y'all, I'm still. <laughs> you want to push it and shove it into the sun? There are hundreds of thousands of asteroids out there. That would be a huge job pushing them into the sun. So we think we think it's easier to just keep ducking. Okay? Now I have a second. Why okay. don't they just take a huge sheet of like metal? So yeah. If, even if it's a non-Newtonian solid, when it hits it, it'll solidify it, and then the chunk of metal will just go in. Since it's bigger than the asteroid itself, or might be, or at least as big as, it'll take the entire thing and just push it somewhere else. So what you want is like a big, uh, a, a sweeping blanket. Yes, to, to cap exactly. Thank, thank you, I'm glad I understand what you're saying. So you want a big, you want a big, you want to sweep, a, you want to just sweep away all the bad stuff. That, I mean, maybe one day that's what we'll do. I am. I foresee a future, and you're the right age that you could lead this. Do you want to be the first trillionaire? <laughs> Figure out a way to mine asteroids. They have ingredients that are rare on Earth, but common on asteroids. Platinum, gold, iridium, all these elements that we need in our manufacturing world. You figure out how to mine them, then you know how to go in them, come out of them, move them, deflect them. Then the government, tell me your name again. Jacob. So then the government said, hey, Jacob, that asteroid you're working on is headed towards Earth. Could you deflect it seven inches to the right? And you said, oh, sure, Mr. President. And you move it seven inches to the right. Or to, Madam President, you move it seven inches to the, to, the, to the right. And so once you know how to go to asteroids, manipulate them, mine them, move material back and forth, then the solar system becomes your, your sandbox. You can move things around, and there is no longer any fear of impact. And you will not be one of these idiots who were interviewed when the asteroid was coming, saying, I'll go get drunk on the beach, because you will figure out how to save the world. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you all. Thank you all.